Hello. So last week we talked about volcanoes, earthquakes, and the origin and evolution of the ocean floor. These are all different phenomena that result from plate tectonics. And we ended the ocean floor lecture by talking about what happens as an ocean basin closes due to continued subduction. And that leads us into today's topic, which is mountain building. So we'll start by just talking a little bit about mountain building, what different types of mountains look like um, around the world. We'll look at the different forces that go into building mountains, either in subduction zones or in uh, collision zones between two different uh, continental plates. We'll talk about some different mountain building episodes that have shaped Europe over the course of the Earth's history. And we'll finish by talking about the principle of isostasy. So if you look at this map, you'll see a number of different geologic features that are highlighted by different colors. So in red, we have uh, young mountain belts. These are mountain belts that are formed, uh, that have formed in the last 100 million years. And they are continuing to form today. So we're looking at things like the North American Cordillera in the Western part of North America, as well as the Alps or the Himalayas. And so what characterizes these mountains is the fact that they're very jagged, they're rough topography, they're very tall, um, and they are continuing to grow uh, through the present time. Um, we can contrast that with old mountain belts. So these are mountain belts that are no longer forming actively. Um, so the, the forces that shape them have now sort of gone away and we're ending, we end up with um, these smoothed out mountains. So this example here comes from the Appalachian Mountains in Eastern North America. So they've been smoothed out due to erosion um, they tend to have lower topography, uh, again, because of different forces that we'll talk about later in the lecture. Um, so you can see that here because we have trees covering the summit of most of these mountains, um, which is not something that we see in the much taller mountains in, uh, for example, Central Asia. Um, so we've got sh you know, shorter mountains or less topographically prominent mountains. Um, that have been smoothed out over time as a result of erosion and other, other forces. Uh, we also have uh, highlighted some different examples of what are known as shields. So I'm pointing here at the Orinoco Shield. There's the Greenland and Canadian Shields here hidden by this uh, image. Um, other examples around the world. So shields are stable, very old portions of continental crust. They're, most of them are Precambrian in origin, so they're over 570 million years old, and they have changed very little in that time as a result of tectonic forces. Um, they might still have erosion and other, and other forces acting on them, but they haven't been shaped tectonically. So all of this is a process that is known as orogenesis. Orogenesis is just a word that means building mountains or creating mountains. Um, so these are the processes that corrective, collectively produce a mountain belt. Um, an example here on the left is a mountain in Canada called Mount Kidd. Um, and you can see that there are some sedimentary layers in the mountain that we can see. And you can also see that those layers have been deformed. So this is a mountain that displays the uh, deformation processes that shaped it. Uh, and we call these compressional mountains because it's displaying this visual evidence of compressional forces. Um, we may also see indications of metamorphism or other or igneous activity. Uh, we'll have an example uh, coming up in a few slides showing some of that. Um, but the big, the big takeaway from all of this is that plate tectonics provides a model uh, for how to build mountains or how mountains are built uh, on the surface of the earth. Um, 
because if you look at this figure, for example, you see that all of these mountains that are forming, so all of the young mountain belts are forming in places where we have different plates coming together. Um, so this, yeah, so we have uh, major mountains that have formed or are forming along convergent plate boundaries. So the question that I'd like you to just take a minute to think about is how you would explain the formation of mountains without the principles of plate tectonics. So if we don't think that mountains are being formed by different plates of lithosphere uh, being pushed together by tectonic forces, how do we get tall mountains? So go ahead and pause the video and we'll continue after that. So the main theory that was put forth uh, in order to explain how mountains were formed on the earth before we had the theory of tectonics um, was that when the earth was still young and forming, it was very hot. So this is something that we also talked about in the um, initial solar system lecture uh, in this course. And so the earth was very hot. It was covered in a layer of molten rock. And as it cooled, it contracted. And that contraction was thought to have produced sort of wrinkles that show up as mountains on the surface. So you can think about this as well if you have, for example, an orange um, that you let sit out for a long time. As it dries, it sort of shrinks and hardens, and maybe you'll see some, some bumps coming up on the surface. So that was the, the theory that was put forth to explain how mountains formed. It's not a very satisfactory explanation, um, and it doesn't answer a lot of the questions that came up um, in terms of asking how different features formed. Um, so again, we're just looking here at the map of the world with the different uh, major mountain belts labeled, and you can see that they're forming, the current you know, the mountains that are currently forming are forming along convergent plate boundaries. So either along subduction zones, like the North American Cordillera here, or the Andes Mountains, or along a boundary between two different continental plates. So the Alps and Caucasus uh, Himalaya Mountains um, are all examples of a colliding plate boundary. So if you think back to the lectures on plate tectonics, when we talked about uh, subduction zones, hopefully you'll remember uh, some of the different features of subduction zones um, or some of the different features that form in subduction zones. So we have two different examples here where we have a convergent plate boundary where ocean, oceanic lithosphere is subducting underneath, uh, other, underneath other oceanic lithosphere, or we have oceanic lithosphere subducting underneath continental lithosphere. Um, and so in both of those cases, we have the formation of, an, uh, of a volcanic arc. When it's occurring on an oceanic plate, it forms an island arc or a volcanic island arc. And when it's forming on a continent, it forms a continental volcanic arc. Um, we also get the formation of a deep ocean trench uh, at the boundary where, the, where one plate is subducting underneath the other one. Um, and in the case of the oceanic-oceanic convergence, we have a four arc that forms between the trench and the volcanic island arc. In the continental oceanic case, we have the four arc forming between the trench and the continental volcanic arc. And then on the opposite side of the, of the volcanic arc from the trench, we have the formation of a back arc. So in this example for the oceanic-oceanic uh, convergence, um, <clears throat> that back arc is forming in between the volcanic island arc and the continental margin. And in the oceanic continental case, it's forming on the continent itself. So when we get mountain building in volcanic island arcs, um, this is, again, where we have subduction of oceanic lithosphere under other oceanic lithosphere. 
Um, so in this case, the growth is coming from primarily two different, uh, coming from a, a few different sources. Uh, we can have growth of the island arc coming from volcanic activity, which we've talked about in the past lectures. We can also get the placement of what are called igneous plutons. So these are, this, this is magma that has arisen into the, um, into the rocks or into the, the crust at the surface and cooled, um, which causes uh, some uplift. Or we can get sediment that scrapes off of the subducting lithosphere and then accretes onto the island arc. Um, over time, if we get continued growth, we end up or can end up with what are known as, uh, we can end up with parallel belts of igneous and metamorphic rocks. Um, so this is, for example, what you see in the islands of Japan. So Japan is an example of uh, this sort of island archetype mountain building. Um, but really, this is just sort of one phase in the development of mountain belts. It's sort of how you start building the raw materials to build bigger mountains, if you want to think of it like that. Okay, so the first type of mountain building, or the next type of mountain building that we'll talk about is Andean-type mountain building. Um, and this is where we have subduction happening underneath a continent. So the example here is the Andes Mountains in South America, where the name comes from. So we start off with a passive continental margin. Now think of this like, or think back to the oceanic floor lecture last week, where we talked about the different types of continental margins. So this is the continental margin where we don't have uh, tectonic activity taking place. After some period of time, the forces, the tectonic forces may change direction and we initiate subduction underneath the continent. Um, this only will happen, of course, if the oceanic lithosphere is dense enough to sink or to subduct underneath the continent. Um, but over time, this forms a continental volcanic arc. We can get these, the emplacement of crystallized magma. Uh, again, this is what's known as a batholith. Um, and eventually we have some uplift and erosion that exposes the batholith at the surface. Uh, I should also mention that um, as magma is intruding into the crust, it's, um, or as, sorry, as the subduction is happening, we have water on the surface of the subducting plate that lowers the melting temperature of the surrounding rock, causing triggering volcanism. Um, we then have magma that rises up into the crust and it sort of pools there. This is what's known as a primary magma. This is the, the initial um, magma that has formed. As it starts to cool, you get crystallizing of some of the, or you can get crystallizing of some of the heavier minerals which makes the magma less dense and it rises or it can rise even higher. Um, this is what's known as a secondary magma. Um, so once, once you have this magma that's rising, uh, it eventually crisp, crystallizes and forms again, these batholith features. So this is a diagram of what this looks like. So we're starting again with a passive continental margin. Uh, we have continental lithosphere and we have oceanic lithosphere off to the one side. After a period of time, we end up with um, the plates changing direction and we get the initiation of subduction underneath the continent. Um, we get the formation of an accretionary wedge. So this is where sediment is being scraped off of the subducting plate. Uh, we get this partial melting again, and we get these um, batholith or pluton features uh, forming in the, um, in the continental volcanic arc. After some period of time, subduction ceases and we get some uplift of this secretionary wedge and erosion, which uh, eventually exposes the batholith features that have been placed uh, during the active volcanism. <clears throat> so 
so another uh, a look at this, um, what this might look like uh, in the real world. This is an example from uh, Torres de Plaine in southern Chile. And what you see in this mountain is two different types of rocks. First, you see these dark rocks, which are metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. And you see this cream colored rock, which is a granite that formed as a magma intrusion into the sedimentary rock because the granite was, because, because the magma was partially molten, it metamorphosed the sedimentary rock. And eventually the whole thing was uplifted and uh, erosion exposed these features at the surface. Another type of mountain building that can take place is what's known as Cordilleran type mountain building. So this is where we have, uh, we also can get subduction underneath a continent. Um, but what we, what we have here is uh, subduction zones that form an island arc. You know, so we get, um, we get volcanic islands that are forming off the coast. And as we continue subduction, um, those islands are sort of accreted onto the continent. They're sort of just smashed into the continent as, um, as the two plates are coming together. So you can see that in this map here, um, you have all of these different colors representing rocks of different origin. So these are all different uh, either old crustal fragments or volcanic arcs, volcanic islands that formed um, in some cases what are known as microcontinents, so something like Madagascar, um, that has eventually just been sort of shoved into the North American continent as the Pacific Ocean, uh, or as the Pacific plate has continued to open up and then subduct underneath North America. Um, so these individual blocks are known as terrains, T-E-R-R-A-N-E-S. These are, um, so th again, these are just sort of rocks that are different from the continent that they are attached to. So they've formed in a different way or in a different place. They're uh, sort of what's known as exotic material. So something that's come from far away, um, if you like. So what this looks like uh, in a diagram. Um, so we have again a subduction zone. We have a subducting oceanic lithosphere underneath um, underneath a continent, formation of a continental volcanic arc. We have a trench, and then we have these inactive island arcs that are being subducted, as well as eventually this microcontinent. So it moves as this all moves towards this continental margin. For example, you have the volcanic arc that ends up getting sort of sheared off of this subducting plate. It kind of plugs up the trench and it eventually can cause subduction to cease. Um, so you end up, again, you just sort of smear this, uh, this island arc onto the continent um, that, is, uh, that is formed here on the, on the right. Over time, eventually we also see this microcontinent. Uh, so again, think something like Madagascar um, that moves into this continental margin. We might get the reactivation of subduction, the reformation of an ocean trench. And eventually this microcontinent will also be accreted onto the continental margin. Okay, so this is probably a good place to take a pause. So go ahead and pause the video, um, go stretch your legs and uh, come back in a few minutes. Okay, so another type of mountain building that we'll talk about today is what's known as alpine type mountain building. So this is where we have two continental, two pieces of continental lithosphere that are coming together. Um, Another definition here is that the area where the two continents come together, so where they sort of weld onto each other, is what's known as a suture. Um, and where that suture forms, we can also find what are called ophiolites. Uh, and these are preserved portions of oceanic lithosphere that help us identify where that, 
um, where that sort of original continental boundary was. Um, so if you remember to last week's um, lecture on the oceanic floor, you have, uh, so all of these, um, all of these boundaries are sort of starting as an ocean basin separating two continents and eventually the continents as they come together, it sort of folds and pushes all of these uh, ocean sediments into, um, into the continent that's being collided with. In this case, we have the African plate um, that is sort of compressing the Mediterranean basin into Southern Europe. So one of the features that we can see in these sorts of compressional mountain building episodes is what's known as a fold and thrust belt. So we have here these originally horizontally placed sedimentary layers. And as we, com as we apply a compressive force to them, we get thrust faulting that happens along weak spots in the different layers. And we get this sort of build up and folding that occurs as well as the thrust faulting. As we continue applying the compressive force, we see additional thrust faults forming, more folding, and this keeps going. And we get these nice sort of wave or ridge-like features that can develop where we have multiple thrust faults sort of built up on top of each other alongside these folds. So you can see that in the schematic here, as well as in this um, cross-sectional view um, that you can see down at the bottom of the, um, of the slide here. So I mentioned last week during the ocean floor lecture that the Himalayas were formed or began forming as a result of a collision that started about 50 million years ago. So India broke off of the supercontinent Pangaea and moved rapidly northward. And it closed in this ocean basin that separated it and the continent of Eurasia. As time went on, the ocean basin grew smaller and smaller until eventually what you see is that um, the ocean basin closed off we ended subduction and we got this large collision between these two pieces of continental lithosphere. Um, so we have uh, a major uplift event that occurred in, as a part of this forming the Tibetan Plateau. And a big reason for the, the way that this has formed is because of the different um, lithologies that are involved. So the subcontinent of India or the continental lithosphere that makes up India um, is made of Precambrian rock. And you remember I mentioned earlier that Precambrian rock is this very old, very, uh, very rigid material that formed about 570 million years ago. And so India has largely resisted deformation because of the, the type of rock that it that makes it up. So as it's collided with Eurasia, it's sort of acted as this large solid block that has kind of compressed um, and caused all sorts of different uh, thrust and fold belts that have um, built up the Himalayas over this time. India is still moving northward at this time. Um, so we still see this upward growth of the Himalayas uh, as a result of this ongoing collision. If we look at this in a map view, what we can see is that we have this, again, cold, dense, rigid slab that makes up India moving northward into Eurasia. You can see the very large uplifted area that is now the Tibetan Plateau, as well as the main arc of the Himalayan mountains. Um, but in addition to that, you also see that we've developed these faults off to the southeast uh, from where the main interaction is occurring. And what's happening is that as India is pushing or continuing to push into Eurasia, uh, we're seeing that Southeast Asia, this area with uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand 
is moving off towards the southeast. It's sort of being squeezed out um, as the as the Eurasian block is um, compressed. And the same thing is happening with uh, most of mainland China. It's being pushed off a little bit more towards the east rather than uh, sharply to the southeast. Um, so if we look at some examples of the Himalayan mountains today, you can see, again, these are very sharp, jagged peaks, uh, very tall mountains, uh, indicating that they're still very young. They're still forming. Uh, if we look back to Europe now, what we can see uh, is that there have been a number of different, uh, what are called orogenies or mountain building phases that have formed Europe. Um, so we'll talk about a few of those. The first is the Caledonian orogeny, which formed a lot of the mountains that we see in Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, as well as Scandinavia. Um, this is the same mountain building episode that formed the, well, formed parts of the Appalachian Mountains in Eastern North America. Um, there's also the Variscan or Hersonian um, orogeny, which formed parts of sort of more central, southern, and western Europe, and then the Alpine orogeny, which is forming the Alps today and is continuing. So starting with the Caledonian orogeny, um, this formed lots of or large parts of northern Europe, as I mentioned. So Scandinavia, we get uh, the mountains along the east coast of Greenland as well, uh, and the sort of mountains in Scotland and Ireland. Um, so this is a mountain building episode that took place between about 490 and 390 million years ago. Um, this occurred after the closure of the Iapetus Ocean. This is uh, the ocean that formed some of the sedimentary rocks that we saw um, on the field trip last week. Um, and we got this sort of three-way collision between the continents of Laurentia, Baltica, which is sort of formed uh, sort of eastern and northern, or northern, eastern and northeastern Europe, um, a large part of North America and Greenland, and then parts of sort of Western Europe as well, this continent called Avalonia. Um, so this, this mountain building episode formed, uh, among other things, the Sparrens and the Donegal Mountains uh, here in Ireland, as well as the Nuri Granodiorite up complex, um, another formation that we'll talk about here in Northern Ireland. So the Sparrens Rocks is this, or Sparren Mountains are this mountain range sort of to the south of us here in Coleraine, and it bends off uh, towards the southwest until it's eventually headed west uh, into County Donegal. So these rocks were originally deposited in pre-Cambrian times, so 700 to 600 million years ago, uh, and they were originally sandstones, mudstones, and limestones. So these are rocks that are, these are sedimentary rocks that are forming in river deltas, they're forming in shallow warm seas, because remember that all of Ireland and Britain were much closer to the equator at this time. Uh, and as a result of the Caledonian orogeny, um, we had these rocks metamorphosed uh, and forming the schists and quartzites that make up the, the mountains today or make up the rocks that we can see there today. Um, further to the west in County Donegal, we have um, limestones that have metamorphosed into marbles. Uh, we get slates that were originally mudstones and we have quartzite that was originally formed as sandstones. So again, we have the same, the same uh, sedimentary rocks that were making up this part of Ireland um, that are being transformed in similar ways as a result of this, um, as a result of this mountain building episode. Um, and then in the mountains of Warren, so down here to the south of Belfast, uh, we have what's called the Nuri Granodiorite complex. Um, so these are igneous intrusive rocks um, that were for, that, that formed at depth, again, similar to the example that we saw from Chile earlier, 
um, and then are eventually brought to the surface as a result of uplift and erosion. And you can see an example here of a dolerite dike. Um, this black stripe or this very dark stripe of rock in this lighter uh, stripe. You can also see a nice little fault um, here as well. Um, so again, we, we see evidence of metamorphism. We see evidence of um, igneous rocks intruding into the sedimentary rocks. We see evidence uh, of uplift and all of these other sorts of forces coming together. Later on, we have what is called the Veriscan or Hersonian uh, orogeny. And so this is what has formed mountains in parts of uh, southern and southwestern Europe. So for example, Spain and Portugal, France, um, parts of Germany, uh, sort of more north of the Alps and more sort of to the northwest of the Alps. Um, so this is during the Carboniferous era, which is if you remember from our field trip, when the sandstones in Valley Castle were formed. Um, and this is a result of the collision of two continents, uh, La Russia and Gondwana. And this is actually what helped form the supercontinent of Pangaea. And in Ireland, it formed the mountains of South Munster. So in Ireland, we get, again, in, in a couple of different areas, we have these very nicely folded sedimentary layers in an area called Lakshini, just north of Dublin. And these are originally sedimentary rocks that were folded and thrusted in a very, um, very nice way. And they're originally, again, carboniferous, so they're formed at about the same time as the sandstone that we saw in Valley Castle. We also uh, see similar folding or evidence of folding uh, in the hills near Bantry Bay down here in the southwest of Ireland. In central sort of southern central France, uh, we have an area that's known as Massif Central. Uh, and this is a, a highland area in southern France that is composed mostly of granitic metamorphic rocks. And this was, uh, these were uplifted and formed at this same time as the uh, folds that we just saw from uh, parts of uh, Ireland. And finally, we're now looking at the Alpine orogeny. So this is affecting, among other places, Southern Europe, um, starting from about 65 million years ago. So as the North Atlantic is opening up, um, around the same time that we're also seeing large um, large amounts of volcanic activity in Ireland, for example, what formed the Giant's Causeway that we saw last week on the field trip. Um, also forming you know, mountains in Turkey, um, Iran, all the way through to uh, the Himalayas. So this is where we have the African plate uh, and the Indian plate moving north, colliding with Eurasia, um, forming lots of different mountain belts um, and eventually closing off the uh, the Mediterranean basin. So you can see here some uh, just some images of the Pyrenees and the Alps. And one thing that you can see is that these are still very young mountains, uh, much like the Himalayas. They're still forming. Uh, there's not been a ton of erosion to really smooth them out over time. Um, you can also see this nice thrust feature uh, here on this image. Uh, where we have some sedimentary layers that have been pushed up on top of this uh, this other layer, this other rock over here. Um, so this is again another example of a compressional mountain. So that brings us to uh, the principle of isostasy. So remember that we have the the less dense lithosphere that is essentially floating on top of the much denser rocks of the mantle. And so much like when you float a block of wood in water or ice in water, you know, that that rock is effectively displacing what's beneath it in order to stay floating. Um, so that that 
concept that everything is sort of in gravitational balance is what we call isostasy. Um, and so when, it, when we apply this to mountains, what that means is that as we're compressing these plates together, as we're building up these mountains, we have to displace material in the mantle in order to compensate for that weight. So we actually get mantle that flows away from where we have the mountain range forming. And so over time, we have erosion that then sort of reduces the weight of the mountain range because it's moving, uh, it's taking material and it's putting it off into the ocean or further into the continent. And so we actually end up with mantle flowing back in and uplifting parts of this mountain range. And eventually over very long periods of time, this sort of eventually goes away and you have sort of a, a normal balance uh, or a normal crust uh, thickness that forms. Uh, this is a similar process to what happens when glaciers and large ice sheets melt. So when you put a, the weight of a massive glacier or ice sheet on top of the lithosphere, uh, that also will displace uh, mantle and cause uh, different flow patterns in the mantle. So one thing that happens as well is that as mountains are growing, gravity is trying to pull them down, right? Much the same way that gravity gets everyone down. Um, gravity is trying to pull these mountains down. And because they're because of the pressure overhead, they're a bit warmer. They tend to be a little bit weaker. And so that actually can cause some flow in the mountains that causes subsidence um, as a result of their weight. So they're sort of flowing outwards. And that helps to, um, that also helps to sort of bring the, the bring things back into balance a little bit. Um, so this, this spreading that happens uh, and the subsidence that happens because of the, the spreading that occurs is what's called gravitational collapse. Um, so when you have older mountains, that's another process uh, that is occurring. So that leads us to looking at the couple of the highest mountains in the world. We have, of course, Mount Everest, uh, nearly 8,900 meters, and it's still growing at about four, million, four millimeters per year. So that's Mount Everest here, and then <clears throat> its location in the map here. And it is, it, it's growing at four millimeters per year, but there's a, you know, a bit of an open-ended question of how much longer is that sustainable? Uh, similarly, we have the, a mountain called Nanga Parbat, uh, here in Pakistan um, that is a bit shorter than Mount Everest. It's only 8,100 8, meters tall, uh, but it is growing at over at, at seven millimeters per year. So it's almost double as fast as Mount Everest. Um, and again, it's just a question of how much longer is that a, a sustainable thing. So that's it for uh, the mountain building lecture. Uh, here's a list of some different videos and uh, other things that you can go uh, look at to learn a little bit more. If you have access to the textbook, um, it's chapter 14, uh, which covers the same material that we've gone over today. But um, otherwise, I hope that you enjoyed it. And please uh, email me uh, if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye.